I did these first two paintings and they're both a generative system. You hit the run button and then up pops the painting on the computer and then you send it to the robot to paint. So the first of these two is a floral scene and every time you hit run you'd get a different arrangement and then the same with this geometric. This is a generative system which you hear about a lot today but this is 25 years ago. So the first two paintings were successful. I was happy with that part of it, but there was a huge problem, and one I hadn't anticipated. When you're painting in front of an easel, you don't worry about changing colors, they're all laid out in front of you, and you don't worry about washing the brush, because you do that at the end. But for these paintings, I had to manually change the colors, and I had to manually wash the brush as needed. With acrylics, they dry quickly, and so you have to wash the brush periodically, else the bristles get too stiff. I built this little beeper inside the robot cabinet, and it would beep, and then I'd look on the computer screen, and it'd say, okay, change color four to color seven. And so I, I said, man, this isn't gonna work. I can't spend the rest of my life doing paintings, hanging around and washing the brush and changing colors and stuff. The robot part was automated, but not the whole robot work cell. I realized that I had to automate the paint exchange and the brush washer. And I had to think about what that might be and what it would look like and how to design it. My idea was then that the carriage of the robot would move left and right and up and down just like it normally would, but on the other side are these shelves of paint. So let's say you wanted to get the color on location 17. So the robot knows what the coordinates for that. So it'd move the X motor over and move the Y motor up or down to be exactly right in front of that location. Now the question is, how do you grab that jar of paint? I knew that pneumatics might be a solution. You give air pressure to something in a cylinder and it makes something turn or rotate or move linearly. So the way it might work if you want to grab that jar of paint at location 17, it opens the gripper, it extends out, and then the gripper closes, and then it retracts, and then it uses that third pneumatic and pivots back around to the wall, and then it extends out again to have the jar of paint underneath the wrist and the brush. So now when you're using pneumatics, the computer controller sends signals to the control panel on the back of the robot's wall to open and close these airlines. Each airline has 60 pounds of pressure, and so those airlines then go through all these cable carriers out to where they're needed. But the computer doesn't know if you say open gripper or retract arm that it did that. In addition to two airlines for each pneumatic device, you have two sensors. So if you take, for instance, the extension arm, when it extends out, the sensor is there saying, yeah, it got there, and a signal goes back to the controller and saying, yeah, I got there. And so then in software, you say, well, I'll give you three seconds to tell me you got to where you're supposed to be or you open or close the gripper, and then everything is scope aesthetic. What's amazing about all this pneumatics, besides it being so much fun to, to build and to control with all the software and the hardware and the airlines and stuff, was it, it, it worked. It worked the first time. So that's pretty amazing because nothing ever works the first time. I guarantee it. And so it was a good day. So now there's an epilogue to this story. And if you notice, I have a clean carpet underneath Dulcinea here. And to keep it that way, I had to add one more feature. At the initial startup of the whole robotic work cell, the computer and Dulcinea don't know if there's a jar of paint left in the gripper from the last time it was running. If you look over here where the jar of paint goes, you'll see this little black sensor. And so when you first power up, it tells the system whether it's okay to go on or not. These three pipes behind Dulcinea here go about 80 feet into the utility room. One of those pipes is clean water, one is dirty water returning from the brush washer, and the third is compressed air that we're going to need for both the brush washer and the paint exchange. 
I built a timer into the robot for 25 minutes. So even if you're on the same color at the 25 minute point, it's gonna wash that brush to clean the bristles and soften them up again. I had this idea for a brush washer, kind of like a vertical car wash. I built these two cylinders. One fits just inside the other with maybe a quarter inch of space. And then I had the idea of a shower pouring down on the bristles. So I drilled 20 little holes at an angle pointing down to the center of the cylinder. And so my idea was that the brush would go up and down into the middle of where these 20 jets of water are. I put a sawhorse in front of my fence here and I had a test panel and I would manually turn the water on and off and I would manually dip the brush in the paint and then manually move it up and down in the shower and everything worked fine and so I said okay so I took all the hoses and the controls and stuff and that board and I mounted it on the back wall of the robot here and I tried it out and so the robot's painting away and then it's time to clean the brush so it cleans the brush and then it starts painting again that oh no one of these problems strikes you that you weren't anticipating the brush was not clean and I had the old color and the new color I had a mess on my hands here the problem was that I was cleaning it on the outer edge of the bristles but I wasn't cleaning it deep inside so after crying for two days and thinking about it I said how would I clean the brush myself I'd go over to my industrial sink and I would squish the bristles on the bottom of the sink with the water running and squish it around and clean it that way. So then I had the idea, build this little stool inside the brush washer. Then I corrugated the surface of that like a ripple effect so I'd be able to squish the bristles across that. The robot knows what number brush it is and then it can look up the length of those bristles, the size of that brush, so it knows how far down it can push into the bristles without destroying the brush. The problem then was there was just so much water in the brush and so if I drilled a hole and I added an air line and so I just blow all the bristles dry and I know the length of the bristles so I can move it up and down and spin it around slowly as it blows all the water out. But then you have to reshape the bristles afterward otherwise they're going to be flaring all around. So you need to keep it a little bit damp so that you can reshape it. Underneath here, you can see this little black sensor, and that senses if there's water there or not. In this case, it would be dirty water. And so then that sensor tells the computer, hey, I got dirty water, why don't you turn the pump on? For the pain exchange, you have these signals going back and forth that confirms whether the pneumatic vise open or close the gripper, retracted, etc. But on the brush washer, there's some fascinating software going on. I actually have three programs running in parallel. When that brush is going up and down and squishing on the bottom, you got robot two going up and down, and you got robot one twisting it left and right and pivoting it back and forth like a pendulum. And then you got program three pumping out the dirty water and turning on the clean water. And you got all these things going on simultaneously. I might be the only one that sees it, but I know exactly all this choreography that's going on in real time. Okay, so now that the paint exchange is working and the brush washer is working, it's been tested, I was ready to create a new painting from scratch. 3,500 brush strokes and it's exchanged in all kinds of colors. I loaded all the jars of paint and I hit the run button and I knew it was going to take quite a while for that many brush strokes. I left for the evening and the first time ever that I had Dulcinea running unattended and in this case overnight. Needless to say, I was full of high anxiety and nervousness in the morning when I unlocked the door and walked into the studio. Lo and behold, 
There it was, success. And not only was I happy, but Dulcinea had also turned off her own power. And that just really struck me, that self-awareness. And I'd forgotten all about that. I had this one line of code at the end to turn off your, your power. Building the robot was not always easy, but by following the fusioneering path, you're living your dream, you're in the moment, and you're doing what you love to do.